So I'd like to know how everybody is doing so far. I really want to know about where you are in your, in your work. Um, today I want to start section 8.8, .8, kind of a long section. Um, are you on 8.6, 8.7? What have you attempted? 8.7 was power series, 8.6 was the alternating series. What do you feel the most comfortable with in terms of your recent stuff? weird semester for me. I don't feel like I'm teaching because I feel like I'm talking to this thing here, just writing stuff down and you write it down. I'm used to giving out handouts and watching you do problems and having students come to office hours, those kind of things. So I really have no feel for what you guys are getting or not getting. That's why I'm begging you to tell me how we going. Okay, medium. Well, one of the handouts that I would have done was this review of alternate series and power series. And so I have three alternating series up here. And the question is, decide whether the series converges absolutely, conditionally, or if the series diverges. So remember, absolute convergence can be checked in one of two ways. Um, you can do the first way, the generalized ratio or group tests. Put your uh, AN plus 1 divided by AN or your nth root of your expression in absolute value. Get a limit. The size of the limit tells you whether the series converges or diverges. Um, the other way is to just test your series in absolute value with one of our positive series tests. If the series converges in absolute value, then the series is absolutely convergent. Um, if the series is not absolutely convergent, then we check for conditional convergence. And all three of these are alternating series. So we would check for conditional convergence with the alternating series test. In the alternating series test, you just look at the non-alternating part and you show that the limit of that non-alternating part is zero and forms a decreasing sequence. So if it's a limit of zero and it's decreasing, then it converges as an alternating series, which means it converges conditionally. If it does neither of those two things, then the series diverges. Is it possible for a series to be absolutely convergent and not conditionally convergent? Not possible. Is it possible for a series to be conditionally convergent, but not absolutely convergent? Yes, that's possible. That's why I'd like to, you to check it in the order of absolute convergence first, conditional convergence, if it's not absolutely convergent, if those two fail, then the series is divergent. Now, I said you can use either the absolute value of the series to check for absolute convergence, or the ratio test. You can kind of tell which ones will work for the ratio test. Of the three here, um, only one of them will work with the ratio test. Which one? The third one, correct, part C. The other two, you'll have to check the absolute value uh, of the series. In other words, you just check this part here if it converges in absolute value. Okay, so try those three. Let me give you a minute. Ask questions if you have them. Same with you guys at home. You can always ask your question out loud or ask your question in the chat box. But please try these three. I'm really going to emphasize that you write things up in a logical manner. What you're essentially doing is doing kind of a mathematical proof. You're proving whether these things converge absolutely or converge conditionally or diverge. So you have to have a convincing argument laid out on your paper, not just state an answer. So 
as our as our discussion said, for part A, to check for absolute convergence, we're going to test the series of absolute value. Same with part B, but in part C, we can use the general ratio test. Give you about 10 minutes here. We're going to have some somewhat quiet time for 10 minutes while you work these, but please ask questions when you have them. And this particular handout is on Blackboard. Um, I know I put these two hour videos on Blackboard, but if you want something shorter in each of the little notebooks for the section, there are 30 minute videos for each section that I did last semester when we were sent home. So if you want a shorter dose of the videos, I would recommend those.
think in this list of three prior problems, you get one of each type. One of them is absolutely convergent, one of them is conditionally convergent, one of them is divergent. Then again, but again, that part A is conditionally convergent. Have a chance to finish part A. The rest of you. I'm not sure I have my test for conditionally convergent. Okay. I, I voted that we test the absolute value of a series to check for absolute convergence because there are no factorials or no n powers. So let me show you how to do this. First test VAS. This, this is our test for absolute convergence. And so when we take the absolute value of this, the absolute value of negative one to the K, K squared plus one over K cubed, that just gives us the K squared plus one over K cubed. So if I look at that as a series, I can compare this series. It's now positive term series, so I can use my positive term series test. And I'm going to compare to the series that just has a k squared on top and a k cubed on the bottom. I just threw the 1 away. That simplifies to 1 over k. That's a p series. p is 1. Does that mean it converges or diverges as a p series? Diverges. This is a divergent p-series. And I can use the direct comparison test, which says that if the original series is bigger than a divergent series, then it's divergent. And the original series is bigger by 1 in the numerator. So by the direct comparison test, Um, I have that k squared plus 1 over k cubed is bigger than k squared over k cubed. Bigger than divergent is divergent. Doesn't mean that this series diverges. It means the absolute value of that series diverges. So from here I can say it's not absolutely convergent. If it's not absolutely convergent, it could possibly be conditionally convergent. So second, we're going to test for conditional convergence. We're going to use the alternating series test to check for conditional convergence. Two steps of the alternating series test is to see that the limit of the non-alternating part goes to zero.
and to see if it's the non-alternating part is decreasing. Can you tell if this thing has a limit of zero? We can. The degree on the bottom is bigger than the degree on top. So that part holds. There are two ways to check for decreasing. One way is to check if AK plus one is smaller than AK. The other way, which I'm going to use here, is to take the derivative and show the derivative is negative. So I'm going to show decreasing by showing that the derivative, the derivative with respect to K of K squared plus one over K cubed negative. If there's just a single K in the denominator, it's easy to show that it's decreasing by comparing AK plus one with AK. But this one has K's at the top and the bottom. Um, so I'm going to take the derivative. And we'll get the bottom times the derivative of the top minus the top times the derivative of the bottom over the bottom squared. I've got some common factors on top. I've got a k squared, a k cubed, and a k to the sixth. Let's knock out a k squared everywhere. Cancel a k squared here. Cancel two of those here. Cancel two of those there. And then we're going to multiply that out on top. That'll be k times 2k is 2k squared minus 3k squared minus 3 all over k to the fourth. So my numerator is negative. It's a negative k squared minus 3, which can be written as a negative k squared plus 3. k squared plus 3 is positive for any k, so minus k squared plus 3 is always negative. k to the fourth is always positive. So no matter what k is, this is negative. So it is decreasing. It does the two things that the alternating series test tells us makes a convergent alternating series. So our conclusion is that this series is conditionally convergent. Any questions on any of the steps or any of the things that I've written up here? Including these folks at home? They want to see all this train of thought here. Okay. Start the same way. Yes, sir. On the part where we testing for absolute convergence, uh -huh. um, the way I did it is if I split it into over k squared over k cubed plus one. Perfect. Perfect. Is there like a specific name for part of the summation, part of the series divergence, or the whole thing diverges? Is there if you just say that, that's fine. Right? That's beautiful. If you thought of this series as k squared over k cubed plus one over k cubed, and notice that one over k diverges, remember that. The sum of a divergent plus a convergent is divergent. That's beautiful. That's ma magnificent. I like that. Okay. I want you to come in part B and tell me why this series in part B is absolutely convergent. Not even that hard. In the absolute value, that's a series that has a name. That's a Q log. 
Q log converges to the same behavior as a P series does. You look at the power of the K on the bottom, and as long as it's larger than one, it converges. So in absolute value, in part B, we have a Q log series that is convergent. So that means it's absolutely convergent. So here's how I would write that. So again, we first test for absolute convergence. So if you write this, then I know you're testing for absolute convergence. And so when we take the absolute value of this series, it gets rid of the negative one to the K plus one. Everything else in here, will be positive, kind of technically, between negative, from K is one on out is positive, right? So we look at this series, and this is a convergent Q log series. Q is the power on the K in the, the denominator, Q is two, which is bigger than one. And so this series is absolutely convergent. Converges in absolute value. So that leaves the third series to be a divergent series. Let me see if you can tell me why. Let me pull it back down on the screen here. You can use the generalized ratio test because of the factorials. But if you do the absolute value test, you should recognize something. Top it's top heavy. K factorial grows faster than two to the K. So in absolute value, it has a limit that's not zero. And then if you do the alternating series test, where we have to take the limit, that's not zero. Okay, so if you recognize that, that one can be really quick. If you wanna go and do the ratio test, you should find that it's not absolutely convergent with the ratio test. So in part C, I've changed my game plan. I'm going to look at the absolute value of the kth term. So in this case, it just gives us k factorial over 2 to the k. The limit as k goes to infinity of k factorial over 2 to the k is not equal to 0 because it's top heavy. k factorial grows faster than 2 to the k. So it's not absolutely convergent. Nothing shows. Then we jump to the alternating series test, where the first step in the alternating series test is to take the limit of the kth term. Boom, we're done. The limit of the kth term is not zero. So also fails the alternating series test. Same reason. So it's not absolutely convergent, not conditionally convergent, which makes this bad boy divergent. Okay, any questions? Maybe you do want to try the ratio test. Let me see what I've got here. I have one more thing to say about the alternating series test, or alternating series in general. I'm going to have to flip my page over when you're ready for that. Remember, in an alternating series, a convergent alternating series uh, converges to some sum S. 
And we can approximate that sum S by using partial sums. And we can tell how close we are to the actual sum by looking at, um, suppose I add up the first five terms. That's called the fifth partial sum. The fifth partial sum is within the size of the sixth term or the term that I leave off of the actual sum. So that I think is what my next question asks. Number two, number two is an alternating series. It's also a geometric series. Do you recognize that? It's an alternating series and it's a geometric series. In a geometric series, we can find the actual sum. In an alternating series, we can approximate the actual sum. So I want to do both things here. So recall that in an alternating series, in a convergent alternating series, the actual sum S differs from the nth partial sum by no more than the term that you leave off. So S stands for sum, A stands for term number. Okay, so in number two, estimate the sum of the series within four decimal place accuracy, but first let's get the actual sum as a geometric series. So first, note that this is a geometric series that alternates. Let's run out the first few terms. I start with k is 1, so my first term is negative 1 third squared. My second term is negative 1 third cubed. My third term is negative 1 third to the fourth. And then let's put one more on here, negative 1 third to the fifth. And then it goes on and on and on. So that's telling me that A is a positive one ninth and R is a negative one third. Agree? So since R in absolute value is smaller than one, this converges. And it converges to this sum a over 1 minus r. So let's put our numbers in there. A is 1 ninth, r is a negative 1 third. So I have 1 ninth on top, 4 thirds on the bottom. So that's 1 ninth times 3 over 4. 3 goes into 9 3 times. 3 times 4 is 12. 1, 12. On a calculator, 1, 12. I don't know. How big is 1, 12 on a calculator? Anybody got one handy? If I can have this to, say, five decimal places. Did you say 808? Three, three, three is repeating? Okay. All right, so that's the exact value. Now, our estimate. Now, let's estimate it using the stuff that I wrote at the top. 
stuff that I wrote way up at the top. I want to be within four decimal place accuracy. So I want to get 0 .8, 0 0.0833. So I want to see how far I need to add. So let's look at some of these terms. Let's just start here. Um, let's see. What is one third to the fifth? That's our fourth term. Can you also do that one on the calculator for me? Um, negative one third to the fifth. I don't really care about the sign because it'll be an absolute value. Uh, yeah, that's enough because I've got something in the third decimal place. I want four decimal place accuracy. So I need to go farther than this term here in computing my sum. So let's look at the next one. A5 is negative one third to the sixth. Zero, zero, one something. Okay, so that's not close enough either. So let's make a bigger jump. Let's say go to A7, which should be negative one third to the eighth, right? The power and the counter is off. It's 4.57 times 10 to the negative 4, which means I moved this decimal back four places. So I've got 1, 2, 3, 4. So, so far that's not big enough, right? I want four decimal place accuracy. It's still affecting the fourth decimal place. So let's go one more. Let's try A8, which is negative one third to the ninth. Cross our fingers that we're there. Four zeros behind the decimal? Yes. And is the next digit a five or does it round up to a five? It is five. So five technically makes the digit round up, right? So I need this digit here to be smaller than five. I've got to go one more term. How much you got there behind that decimal? Zero, 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 That's small enough. It's not going to affect the fourth decimal place. So what this says, if this is the ninth A9, that means N is eight. So I have to add up the first eight terms. So if AN plus one is represented by A9, then N is eight. So we need to use the sum of the first eight terms. So the sum of the first eight terms is going to be negative one third squared plus negative one third cubed plus negative one third to the fourth plus negative one third to the fifth plus negative one third to the sixth plus negative one third to the seventh plus negative one third to the eighth, right? So we can add those guys up. That's only the seventh. Yeah, no, this is, because my end started at 
Um, oh gosh, you're right. So A9, this really it wouldn't be A9. A4 goes to 5. Right, so I need to go some nine, more. So the nine. So would be A9 is actually negative 1 third to the 10th. That's right. A9 is actually negative 1 third to the 10th. 3, 6, 7, so I need one more. There we go. I can't count over there. And so I'll bet you, I'll bet you this is a point eight zero eight three three. So we'll just pretend we know that. But if you want to check on your calculator, this should give us point zero eight three three. There'll be some junk back here, but we only want four decimal place accuracy. Okay. So it tells us how many we need to add. And some of these converge faster, some of them converge slower. That's only true for alternating series. Okay. Okay, so we need some practice using the ratio test to find the interval of convergence. So let's look at problem number three here. I've given you a power series. It's a power series because it contains the variable two. This is a power series centered at x is two. So what we're looking for is an interval where two is in the center for which this series is convergent. It's a positive term series, so it'll be absolutely convergent. So remember, you start by using the generalized ratio test and you're forcing yourself to look only where it's convergent. So you start with this. The limit as k goes to infinity of the absolute value of a k plus one divided by a k. And you want to know where it's absolutely convergent. You include the terms that uh, have the x's. So this is going to generate an inequality with the variable x. So I will stop talking again for a little bit or try to stop talking and give you time to work this. I'll give you about three minutes. Remember, don't stop once you get the interval on x. Make sure you check the endpoints of that interval one at a time as values of x.
Negative one to five. Negative one to five. And I'm going to get caught up with you here. So for this particular example, this is going to look like um, the limit as k goes to infinity, k plus 1 squared, x minus 2 to the k plus 1, divided by 3 to the k plus 1, times, down here I'll have k squared, x minus 2 to the k, 3 to the k, slap those absolute value bars on, and set it smaller than 1. And remember that 3 to the k plus 1 is 3 to the k times 3 to the 1. And similarly here, I can write that as x minus 2 to the k times x minus 2 to the 1. So let's see if it fits here. From there, we can see that the x minus 2 to the k's will cancel, as will the 3 to the k's. This term has no x uh, k's on it, so it's going to come out in front in absolute value bars. And then we deal with the limit of all the k terms that remain. I'll have a k plus 1 squared on top, and a 3k squared on the bottom. And so the k plus 1 squared represents a second degree polynomial. Same with the bottom. That limit should be the ratio of the coefficients. So this limit is going to be 1 third. That gives me x minus 2 times 1 third is smaller than 1. 
which is the same thing as saying x minus 2 is less than 3. Remember, this 3 is called the radius of convergence. 2 is the center of the interval. And 3 units to the left and right of 2 generate the interval of convergence. So I write it like this. I say that x minus 2 without absolute value bars is between 3 and negative 3. And I'll add 2 everywhere to get the x by itself, which says that negative 1 is less than x is less than 5. Now we individually check the endpoints in the original series. So I let x equal 5 up in here. And I'll have k squared, 5 minus 2 to the k over 3 to the k. 5 minus 2 gives me 3 to the k over 3 to the k. Those cancel. And here's the remaining series. Why does that diverge? Goes to infinity. The limit does not go to 0. Right? This diverges because the limit is not 0. Same thing is going to happen when x is negative 1. The only difference is when x is negative 1, I get a negative 3 to the k here. Negative 3 to the k is the same thing as minus 1 to the k times positive 3 to the k. And once those 3 to the k's cancel, I have an alternating series whose non-alternating part does not go to 0. And so for the same reason, that diverges. So our interval of convergence is the open interval between negative 1 and 5, which means this thing will be absolutely convergent if x is any number in between negative 1 and 5, and it will be divergent at any number outside that interval. Did anybody get all the way through that one, or did I jump in too soon? Got all the way through it? Good, good. Okay, so I've got another one for you. Find the values for which x to the k times k factorial show it, is convergent. For what values is this power series convergent? Find me the interval of convergence.
give us some convergence only for the value of x at zero. Uh, only converges for x is zero because if we do the ratio test, find what makes that smaller than one, then we're looking at the limit as k goes to infinity of x to the k plus one, k plus one factorial divided by x to the k, k factorial. Now again, the x to the k's will cancel, and that gives me an x to the first that I pull out front in absolute value. k plus 1 factorial is k plus 1 times k factorial, so this k factorial cancels the factorial and just leaves me k plus 1. Since this has no denominator, this expression goes to infinity. So the only way that this limit is smaller than 1 is if this x is 0. So it converges only for x is 0. Okay. Now the other case. There were three cases for a power series. It converges on some subset of the number line, converges for only one point, or converges for the entire number line. I want you to show me that this power series, let's call this one part A, and here's part B. Do the same for the power series sum from n is equal to 1 to infinity of x minus 6 to the n divided by n to the n. Tell me why, or show me, that that particular power series converges for all values of x. And it's a quickie because everything in here is to the nth power. So that's the hint that you can use the nth root test with the absolute value bars on it. So oh, we do the nth root test here, it's about one step to it. We're taking the nth root of the absolute value of x minus 6 to the n 
divided by n to the n. So that cancels the n powers and gives me x minus 6 divided by n. Pull the x minus 6 out front. And we've got this limit. But the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n is 0. If I multiply that with anything, I get 0. So for any choice of x, that product is 0, which means the interval of convergence is from minus infinity to infinity. Okay. So that limit of the non-x terms is, is the constant. You'll generate an interval centered around whatever we've got here. If it's infinite, then it only converges for what makes that equal to zero. If the limit is zero, then no matter what x you use, it converges. Okay? Okay, so I'm ready to pick it up where we left off. This was all a review. Um, the important thing about power series is that on its interval of convergence, it matches the behavior of a function. And so if I want to know function values, I can plug those values into the power series as long as they belong in the interval of convergence. If I want to take the derivative of a function, I can take the derivative term by term of its power series. Same thing with an antiderivative. So I'm going to write that down here. This is actually in section 8.7, but it's going to lead me into section 8.8, .8, and we'll use it there. So back to section 8.7. Before I state what I'm going to say, I want you to look at this power series. Power series 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed and so on can be written in summation form. Say I want to say k is equal to 0 to infinity. What would I put in there? Can you give me a general formula that produces that sum? x to the k. For particular values of x, this is a geometric series. Right? Geometric series whose first term is 1 and whose multiplier is x. For what values of R does a geometric series converge? For R an absolute value less than 1. In other words, its interval of convergence is this. Oops, I need an X. It doesn't converge at either endpoint, but it converges for all numbers between 1 and negative 1. So for all numbers between 1 and negative 1, let's take the derivative of this. I'm taking the derivative of both sides of that equation that I wrote up there. 
So I'm going to take the derivative on the left for you. The derivative of 1 is 0. The derivative of x is 1. The derivative of x squared is 2x. Then I get 3x squared, and so on. How would you write that over here? Well, let's take the derivative of it. We have a um, k times x to the k minus 1. Now let's look at our summation symbol. Notice that I can't start at k is equal to 0 anymore, because at k is equal to 0, it gives me a minus 1 power. There are no terms over here with x to the minus 1. Taking the derivative changes the counter by 1. If k is 1, I get x to the 0 times 1. That generates this term. Let's also look at the integral of that. If I take the integral of 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed and do that term by term, then I'm taking the integral here. If I integrate this, I get x plus x squared over 2 plus x cubed over 3 plus x to the fourth over 4, and so on. If I do that over here, I get x to the k plus 1 divided by k plus 1. And so if k is equal to 0, I do get the first term. So we only change the counter on the derivatives. What I did here by taking the derivative term by term is only allowed on its interval of convergence. And same thing here. We can integrate term by term or take the derivative term by term only on the interval of convergence. So now I'll write that down. On the interval of convergence of the power series, um, however I write it, a k times x to the k. This could also be a function of x, but it could be centered somewhere else. The derivative with respect, the start this at k is 0 to infinity, the derivative with respect to x of the sum from k is equal to 0 to infinity of a k x to the k is equal to the sum from k is equal to 1 to infinity. This is a constant. I can pull it out, then take the derivative of x to the k by bringing the power down, raising it to 1 power less. And the integral of the sum from k is equal to 0 to infinity of a k x to the k with respect to x can be done term by term. Oops, not k is 0. We can do term by term differentiation, term by term integration. We can do any term by term operation. We can do function substitution, right? So if I, this was some function of x and I want to substitute something in for it, I can do that as well. Now let's back up to the example that we did of that geometric series. This geometric series up here at the top, let me unzoom. This geometric series, we know its sum. 
it has a sum of a divided by one minus r. So I know that the sum of all of these x to the k's adds up to a, which was one, over one minus r. Here's what we just did without you knowing it. We found the power series representation for this function. The power series representation for one over one minus x is the sum from k is equal to zero to infinity of x to the k, because this is a geometric series, a over one minus r. So let me write that back down here. So the power series representation for 1 over 1 minus x is this thing. And so what if I wanted the power series representation for, so from this, power series for 1 over 1 plus 2x is easy to be obtained. That's still a geometric series form, a over 1 minus r. But you think of the 1 plus 2x as 1 minus a negative 2x, right? So I can take this power series and replace each x with negative 2x. a is 1, r is negative 2x. So it should be a plus a times r plus a times r squared, plus a times r cubed, or go back in here and replace that x with a negative 2x. We can do term by term substitution. If I wanted to put, say, a 10 up on top, then all I'd have to do is take this power series and multiply each term by 10. Think, think, think. From that, from this first one, how do I get the power series for 1 over 1 minus x squared? But think hard how these two are related to each other. Well, this is the square of that, but squaring is not a term by term operation. So I can't just square each term. Can you see another way that they're related? But adding something to the denominator is not a term by term operation. I want you to think of a term by term operation that makes these two related. I mean, if this is true. True, false, maybe. If I take the derivative of this, do I get that? Except for the chain rule will give me a negative here. Right? Let's take the derivative of that. Let me do it on the board so you people at home can't see it. Right? 
bring the power down, raise it to one power less, take the derivative of what's inside. And there she be. So if I want to know the power series of this, I just go back up here and I take the one where I took the derivative of the power series for the other one. So if I go back, I see that I took the derivative here. The power series representation of this then is going to be 1 plus 2x plus 3x squared and so on, which has as its series representation k is equal to 1 to infinity, k, x to the k minus 1. And the interval of convergence is the same as the first one from minus 1 to 1. We're going to use that a lot. We can get power series for functions by using known power series of other functions and performing term by term operations on them. Okay. Okay, so let's make a minor change to this function. Let's look at this example. Let's look at this series here, except for I'm going to put factorials under it. Let's look at 1 plus x over 1 factorial plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial and so on. That's no longer a geometric series because the factorials change, so I don't have a constant multiplier. But I can write it in its general form as a sum from k is equal to 0 to infinity of x to the k divided by k factorial with the knowledge that 0 factorial is 1. What I want you to do real quickly is find the interval of convergence for this. Do the generalized ratio test and tell me what the interval of convergence is for x to the k divided by k factorial. the entire number line? Anybody? Do the ratio test. Take the limit. K goes to infinity. So a k plus 1 divided by a k and set it smaller than 1. So in this example, a k plus 1 looks like x to the k plus 1. 
divided by k plus 1 factorial. Now I'm going to divide by that, so that puts a k factorial here and an x to the k here. k factorial cancels with k plus 1 factorial by knocking out the factorial and just leaving me to k plus 1. x to the k knocks out the x to the k up here, leaving me only x to the 1. I take that x to the 1 in absolute value bars right here. Then I take the limit as k goes to infinity. All that's left on top is a 1 and a k plus 1 on the bottom. And since this has a k in the bottom, but not on the top, its limit is 0. So no matter what x is, this limit, this expression on the left, takes on a value smaller than 1. So the interval of convergence is the whole number line. Are you happy with that? Now, I want you to take the derivative of this term by term. Take the derivative term by term. What we said is I can take that series and move the derivative inside the summation symbol as long as I change my counter now to a 1. Take the derivative in here, term by term. And so here we go. The derivative of 1 is 0. The derivative of x is 1, so I just have 0 plus 1 over 1 factorial plus 2x over 2 factorial plus 3x squared over 3 factorial, and so on. Inside here, I'll have the sum from k is equal to 1 to infinity of k times x to the k minus 1 over k factorial. Now, how do these simplify? I know 1 divided by 1 factorial is just 1. What's 2 divided by 1 factorial? I'm sorry, 2 divided by 2 factorial. 2 factorial is how big? 2. So that cancels. But I'm going to cancel it like this. I'm going to write that as 2 times 1 factorial. So that I can write this as x over 1 factorial. Do the same kind of canceling. Cancel 3 with 3 factorial, and what do you get on the bottom? 2 factorial. The next term would be a 4x cubed over 4 factorial, and 4 and 4 factorial cancels, and leaves you with a 3 factorial on the bottom. This k and that k factorial cancels and leaves me a k minus 1 factorial. But if I realign these, I can start my counter at 0 by adding 1 to each here. And I get the same series of terms. I get these guys. Hey, where have we seen these before? That's what we started with. There's only one function in the entire world, in the entire universe that we know and love, whose derivative is itself. What function is that? This is the power series expansion for e to the x. If you take the integral, you're going to get the same thing as well. Let's integrate this term by term. Let's look at the integral of each of these terms. The 
if I integrate the one, I get x. If I integrate x here, I get x squared over 2. The 1 factorial is down there. If I integrate this, I get x cubed, 3 times 2 factorial. x to the 4th, 4 times 4 factorial. 2 times 1 factorial is 2 factorial. 3 times 2 factorial is 3 factorial, and so on. Well, that's not exactly what we started with. We're off by the one. But hey, when you compute an indefinite integral, don't you get a constant of integration? And guess what that constant of integration is? It's one. So even though we're off by just a constant, two functions that have the same antiderivative can only be off by a constant. This one is the same as that one plus your c, t in your form. So the integral of it is itself, the derivative of it is itself. That tells us blatantly that that is the power series for e to the x. 1 plus x squared over 1 factorial plus, I'm sorry, x over 1 factorial plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial and so on. x to the k over k factorial from k is equal to 0 to infinity. If you wanted to do something to e to the x, you can do it to this polynomial. Derivatives, integrals. And, you know, one function that we have no clue how to integrate is e raised to the x squared power e to the x squared. Don't know how to integrate that. We can't do a u du substitution, but we can integrate its polynomial expansion. We can compute the polynomial expansion for e to the x squared by using this and replacing each x with x squared. And that gives you the expansion for e to the x squared. Then if I want to compute, say, a definite integral of e to the x squared for some reason, I can compute the definite integral of a certain number of polynomial terms until I'm happy with the level of accuracy. That is just outstanding. That just knocks your socks off if you're wearing socks. Okay. All right, so that's the point. We are going to take functions and start from scratch and build their power series. Here we just kind of stumbled into them. I gave you power series and said, look, it matches this function. If you were to put this in Mathematica and graph it, and then project the graph of e to the x on it, fits perfectly over the entire number line. Where if you were to graph this function, say you truncated it in terms, and then you graph that one, it has a perfect fit between negative 1 and 1. Outside negative 1 and 1, it starts doing other things. We're going to build polynomials that match functions on an interval of convergence. Those polynomials are going to be called Taylor polynomials. So that's where we start section 8. Taylor series and its first cousin, McLaurin series. So we're going to talk about a function f, let f be a function of x with the derivatives of all orders in 
Insan interval containing the number C. All right, so we've got f of x somewhere. I don't know, I'm just going to draw it like this. There's some function. So we're going to try to fit a polynomial to this. Maybe it doesn't even wiggle like that. Maybe it grows. Maybe it has uh, movement in it that doesn't look exactly like this. But what it doesn't have is sharp corners. So we've got a sharp corner. There's no derivative. It could have a sharp corner outside some interval containing C. But within the interval containing C, it behaves nicely. So we got to have this, let's suppose the point at x of c is right here. What we need is the Taylor polynomial that we make to have the same value of f when x is 0. In other words, when x is 0 passes through c. It's got to have the same slope at that point. So f prime of c has to match the derivative of the polynomial. It has to have the same concavity at that point and in an interval containing that point. So f double prime in an interval containing c has to be the same. How fast the concavity changes has to match. So the third derivative has to match and so on. And that tells us how we're going to make this polynomial. We're going to make the derivatives at c match. And it's going to look like this. A Taylor series generated by f at x is c is given by the following. Okay, so has the same y-intercept. It has the same slope at that point. Now we're going to make a polynomial. So here's how we make the polynomial. We're going to multiply that by x minus c. And then I'm going to put a 1 factorial down here. Then the next term is going to match the concavity. And we make the polynomial. This now is going to be x minus c squared, right? Polynomials go up by one degree. Under here, you'll have a 2 factorial. Then the third derivative is the rate of change in the concavity at that point. Over 3 factorial, x minus c cubed. Then we'd have the fourth derivative over 4 factorial times x minus c to the fourth, and so on. So that I can write this as follows. I can write it in summation form as the sum, and I'll use n's to get that space, from k is equal to 0 to infinity. I'm going to have the kth derivative of our function. The kth derivative has the k in parentheses at x is equal to c. Then the polynomial term will be x minus c to the k power. And then the factorial term will be the k factorial. Where the zero derivative corresponds to the function itself. And zero factorial is one. And of course, a quantity to the zero power is one. To make a Taylor series of a function in a certain interval centered at C, start taking a bunch of derivatives. Evaluate all those derivatives at C. Here's the recipe. Fill them in. And that matches the value of f in an interval containing C. If we take our Taylor series and shift its C units back, then we get something called the Maclaurin series. The Maclaurin series is a Taylor series where the value of C is equal to zero.
So it looks like f of zero plus f prime at zero over one factorial times x plus f double prime at zero over two factorial times x squared plus f triple prime at zero divided by three factorial times x cubed and so on. Or in summation notation, it looks like the sum from k is equal to zero to infinity. The kth derivative of f at zero over k factorial x to the k. That power series expansion we saw for e to the x was actually Maclaurin series. That one was centered at zero because I just had an x to a power and not an x minus six to a power. So you think, well, why can't I just use a Maclaurin series for everything? We have some functions that aren't defined at zero. One over x, natural log of x, doesn't make sense to make a Maclaurin series for those because those are not defined at zero. So we have to shift those over. Okay. That's it. That's the recipe. These are things that match the value of a function in an interval containing C for some radius of convergence. So let's build one. Let's take that 1 over x function and let's make a Taylor series for 1 over x centered at x is equal to 2. Find the Taylor series, not a, find the Taylor series for f of x is equal to 1 over x centered at x is equal to 2. So that's your value of c. C is called the center. That's going to be the center of the interval of convergence. So we pull out the recipe and it says to do this. Take 1 over x and a bunch of its derivatives and evaluate it at 2. Then take those and divide them by factorials. Those are going to be called the coefficients. Each of these guys right here are the coefficients of the polynomial. There are some places in web work where they just ask for the coefficients. Okay, so those are those. Okay, so let's do it. Start by taking a bunch of derivatives. Let's start with f of x is equal to 1 over x which is the same as x to the negative 1. Let's do about 4 or 5 derivatives. f prime of x is minus x to the minus 2. f double prime of x is 2x to the minus 3. The third derivative of x is minus 6x to the minus 4. Let me write the fourth derivative with a 4 up in parentheses. That's 24x to the minus 5. Let's do one more just for the heck of it. Uh-oh, stupid me. I want to do one more. Now I need to figure out what 5 times 24 is. 5 times 20 is 100. 5 times 4 is 20. How about 120? How about that? I'm going to write those now with positive exponents because I'm going to have to evaluate each of these when x is 2. So think of this as negative 1 over x squared. This one is 2 over x cubed. This one's negative 6 over x to the 4. 24 over x to the 5th. Negative 120 over x to the 6. Okay, now let's evaluate all of those when x is 2. So I get f of 2 is 1 half. f prime of 2 is negative 1 fourth. f triple prime at 2 is 2 divided by 8. Or I could write that as a positive 1 fourth. 
Now, triple prime at 2 is negative 6 divided by 16. I can write that as negative 3 over 8. Fourth derivative at 2 is 24 over 32. Let's see, I can divide both of those by 8. 3 times 8 is 24. 4 times 8 is 32. And then the fifth derivative at 2 is negative 120 over 64. So let's see. Four goes into those. Does eight go into one twenty? Yep, eight goes into one twenty, right? Let's see, eight into one twenty. Eight goes that eighty leaves me forty. Five fifteen times. And eight times eight is sixty-four. So negative fifteen over eight. Now I'm going to put those numbers right here next to x minus 2's to increasing powers. And so I have that in an interval containing x is equal to 2, 1 over x is exactly equal to f of 2, let me write the formula here, plus f prime at 2 over 1 factorial times x minus 2 to the first plus f double prime at 2 over 2 factorial times x minus 2 squared. The third derivative at 2 over 3 factorial times x minus 2 cubed. And then I'll put the other ones in there. You see the pattern. Now we'll put our numbers here. Okay, so here we go. F of 2 is a half. F prime of 2 is a negative 1 4. F double prime of 2 is a positive 1 4. But I'm going to put it in there in the unsimplified form. And you'll see why in a minute. Let me put the 2 over 8 in there. So I'm going to keep the unsimplified forms on top. Put the negative 6 over 16 divided by 3 factorial x minus 2 cubed. And then I'm going to have 24 over 32 divided by 4 factorial, x minus 2 to the 4th. Let me just put a little dot, dot, dot going here. So I think these generate a pattern. One factorial is just one. Two factorial is two times one, so that's two. This 2 factorial will cancel with this 2 in the numerator. It'll leave me with a positive 1 8. What's 3 factorial? 6. That's going to cancel with that 6. It'll leave me with a negative 1 16. 4 factorial is 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. It's 24. 24 here cancels with that 24 and leaves me 1 over 32. That all the factorials are going to cancel with the numerators here. Do you bet that 5 factorial is 120? If 4 factorial is 24, multiply 24 by 5, you do get 120. So this will simplify. All of these are going to cancel. This 2 factorial cancels here. 3 factorial cancels there. 4 factorial cancels there. And so let me run to my next page here. And we can write 1 over x to look like this. 
1 over 2, now let me write that as minus 1 over 4 times x minus 2, plus 1 over 8 times x minus 2 squared, minus 1 over 16 times x minus 2 cubed, plus 1 over 32 times x minus 2 to the fourth. The next term was going to give me plus, or sorry, minus 1 over 64 times x minus 2 to the fifth. I wrote it like that to see if you can come up with a general formula for this. I want to put it inside the summation notation as a function of k. So what do you notice about 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64? Powers of 2, right? Those are powers of 2. Starting with 2 to the first power. This is 2 to the second power. And look at the power on the x minus 2. It's a first. 2 cubed, and the power of p is a squared. 2 to the fourth, power of p is a 3. So let's see if we can write a general formula for that. I'm going to have a summation here. I'm going to have a 1 over 2 to a power appearing to some power. Let me just call it a k, I guess. And then this one is going to be 1 less than that power. Now we got to make it alternate in sign. So how are we going to make it alternate in sign? I can put, this is a minus 1 over 2, and put the k out here. Well, that's not going to cut it because I want my first term to be positive. If I start with k is 0, then that's bad here. If I start with k is 1, that's bad there. So let me just write this term separately. Let me just write it over here. Let me put our 2 to the k here. And then I want this as negative 1 to the k plus 1. And I want to start from k is equal to 1 to infinity. Do you think that works? If k is 1, this is negative 1 squared is a positive 1. k is 1 gives me a 2. If k is 1, I get x to the 0 power. Then if k is 2, I got an odd power, so that makes it negative. K is 2 gives me the 4 here. 2 minus 1 gives me that. So I do have a closed form representation of this, and that's kind of handy because now I can find the interval of convergence. Let's do that. Let's find the interval of convergence for the power series that we made here using the ratio test. Okay, so we're able to write it in closed form. Not always will we be able to do that. That's kind of tricky. I want you to find the interval of convergence. And I'll bet you a dollar the interval does not contain the number zero. Because one over zero is not defined. Anybody want to take me up on that dollar? We can kind of do this ratio test fast. We are quickly running out of time. Quickly, you guys have been sitting there for two hours and not a damn thing about this has been quick. So we're doing the ratio test. We're going to take the limit as k goes to infinity of a k plus 1 divided by a k. I'm going to set that smaller than 1 and solve for x. So in absolute value, I don't even need to include this minus 1 to the k plus 1. We're going to lose that anyway. So save you a step. Don't put that in there. If I replace that with k plus 1, I get x minus 2 to the k plus 1 minus 1. This gives me x minus 2 to the k. 
Then I'm going to divide by that. So I'm going to have an x minus 2 to the k minus 1, and then a 2 to the k. And so we can cancel. This x minus 2 to the k cancels with that one, leaves me x minus 2 to the negative 1. But x minus 2 to the negative 1 flips it and puts it on top. Then this 2 to the k cancels and leaves me a 2 down here. So I end up with, let me just write it this step here. And then do what I said I was going to do. Take that out front in absolute value bars and put it on top. Lose a term. We good there? So as k goes to infinity, one half stays at one half. So I have x minus two times a half is smaller than one. Which says that the absolute value of x minus two is smaller than two. I just multiply two by two. So x minus 2 lives between 2 and negative 2. Now we solve for x, and we get x is equal, or if x is between 0 and 4. Now we need to check the endpoints. So we're going back up in here, and we're putting those x's in. So we're going to put a 0 in there. And I get negative 1 to the k plus 1 divided by 2 to the k, negative 2 to the k minus 1. I'm going to write negative 2 to the k minus 1 as negative 1 to the k minus 1 times 2 to the k minus 1. And so when I multiply these two together, I add exponents, and I get negative 1 to the 2k power. What's a negative 1 to the 2k for any value of k? 1. It's an even power. So this multiplies together to give me negative 1 to the 2k, but that's just equal to 1. These cancel, and it leaves me 2 to the negative 1. If you add up a bunch of 1 halves, you get a big old number. This has a limit that's not 0, so this diverges. If x is equal to 4, the same thing happens. If x is 4, this is a 2 to the k minus 1 and a 2 to the k. And it's going to simplify to the same darn thing. It doesn't go to 0. So our interval of convergence is going to be an open interval. And that's where we end it. We are going to make Taylor and McLaurin series. If we're lucky enough to write it in closed form, we will and then find the interval of convergence. And there's going to be a list of known Maclaurin series that I'm going to have you memorize so that you don't have to start from scratch and reinvent the wheel each time. It's a real easy recipe. Take a bunch of derivatives, evaluate them at the center, and then plug them into the formula. So that's where we are on Wednesday. We've got... Uh, this is the 11th. Um, Monday, we'll finish section 8A. On Wednesday, we'll start reviewing because we have a test scheduled for November 23rd. November 23rd is also the last day that we meet this class in person. You guys are going to go home for Thanksgiving, surround yourself with your COVID loving family, and we don't want you to come back. So we'll continue after Thanksgiving online.
Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody. Anybody at home before I shut off my Zoom call? Have any questions? Or is anybody at home still awake? Anybody at home still there? There we go. All right, I'm gonna hit the old stop share button. And then I'm gonna hit the stop record button.